Take your Bibles and turn with me, please, to Matthew chapter 28. And we're going to look at the last three verses, verses 18, 19, and 20. If you have ever listened to one of my sermons, please do that today. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 28. Every Christian is a disciple, a follower, a learner of Jesus Christ. If you have repented of your sins, believed that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, rose from the dead to give you eternal life, and if there's been that point in time where you've received him as your Lord and Savior, you're a Christian and you're a disciple. You are either an obedient, maturing disciple or you are a disobedient, immature disciple, but nevertheless, you're a disciple. When I was seven years old, I became a disciple of Jesus Christ. As best I knew how, I repented of my sins. I received Jesus and believed on him to save me. Soon after that, like these folks this morning, I got baptized and I started going to church. But no one, and I'm not blaming anybody, just stating the facts, no one taught me how to live the Christian life. I went to Sunday school every week. I heard sermons every week. And that was all good. I went to vacation Bible school every year. My mother got two weeks of vacation off, and she took one of those weeks and taught vacation Bible school. I went to choir. I went to RAs. I heard a lot of Bible stories, and it was all wonderful as far as it went. But along the way, Nobody taught me how to read my Bible. I never read my Bible, except in Sunday school. Nobody taught me how to pray. My parents didn't. Went to church. Dad was a deacon. Mom taught Sunday school. But I thought being a Christian was just going once a week and then do whatever you want the rest of the week. Nobody taught me how to pray. Nobody taught me to worship the Lord. Nobody taught me the fellowship, the importance of fellowship and connecting with other believers. My friends went to church like I did, but most of them did not love the Lord, just like I didn't really have a passion for the Lord. My friends, we didn't call it curse. In Dyersburg, you cuss. We cussed, drank alcohol, never shared the gospel, never prayed, lived worldly lives. Nobody taught me how to share the gospel. Nobody taught me how to get delivered from sinful strongholds. Nobody taught me how to do a lot of things that were important in the Christian life. Thus, for 11 years, I lived like that, an immature, disobedient disciple of Jesus Christ. And the older I got, the worse it was. But then I went to UT Martin and met some real, turned-on disciples of Jesus Christ. I was living in sin just like I did all through high school. But as I went to their Bible studies, I saw that they were approaching the Christian life in the way it ought to be approached, and that is with total abandonment, with complete love for the Lord. Were they perfect? No. But they loved God. And I began to see what real Christianity was about. I, be, I, wanted, I desired to be a real follower of Jesus Christ. I began to yearn 
to be like Jesus. And I realized I had to cut ties with my old buddies from high school. And I can remember them telling me, this will last a few months and then you'll be back with us. That was 42 years ago. I quit partying, stopped drinking, doing those other things that had pulled me down for years. I began reading my Bible. I began praying. I began worshiping the Lord. I'd never lifted my hands before, closed my eyes. But I started doing that. I fellowshiped. I couldn't get enough of connecting with other Christians. Began sharing my testimony, began sharing my faith. Led a guy to Christ out in North Carolina at an FCA camp. I'll never forget the feeling of walking back to tell people that I'd led somebody to the Lord. I started co-teaching a Sunday school class at the Dyer County Jail. It's probably good because they weren't very good lessons, but they couldn't get away. (laughs) I began sharing my testimony with football players, athletes. Started traveling with a friend of mine who had, we'd played football together in high school, George Guthrie. We started a little singing group. We'd go anywhere. We went to churches all over West Tennessee. I remember singing in Leewood Baptist Church here in Memphis on a Sunday morning when Dr. Glisson was there. I couldn't get enough of Jesus. I got tired of football, quit playing football, transferred to Union University. Along the way, I found the call to preach. God let me have Donna. We met there. And to this day, 42 years later, first thing I do in the morning is read my Bible, pray, fellowship with other believers, share the gospel, worship the Lord. It never gets old because he never gets old. I'm so grateful that somebody, some young men at UT Martin took time to disciple me. I want to ask you, have I just described your experience? Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ, but you've never spiritually matured? Are you tired of thinking that going to church is really what it's all about? Are you tired of saying this stuff works for these people, but it never has worked for me. It's not that it doesn't work for you. It's that you have not delved into it deep enough. There's more to the Christian life than just showing up on Sunday morning. There's a daily walk with him, a daily discipleship. There's a real intimate relationship. If you're tired of being undeveloped, immature as a Christian, defeated, if you're tired of that, this sermon is for you. Sometimes I get a little excited when I preach. That's the way I played ball. (laughs) But today, I can't guarantee I won't get excited. But I'm going to try to just say it as plainly as I can. We need to make disciples like it matters. The last words of Jesus to us in the Gospel of Matthew are these. And Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit 
teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. There's only one verb in that whole thing, and it's make disciples. The rest are participles that get their power from that verb. Teaching, going, baptizing, all of it's around making disciples. This is called the Great Commission. Marching orders for every Christian. So what does the Great Commission command us to do? First of all, it tells us to make disciples. How do you make a disciple? Verses 18 and 19, Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. To make a disciple is to win somebody to Jesus Christ. You were made a disciple the moment you repented of your sins and believed savingly in Jesus. You became a disciple of Jesus Christ. We don't have a two-tier kind of Christianity. Okay, you got saved, but you got to memorize this many scriptures to be a disciple. You have to read the Bible this many times to be a disciple. You have to win this many people to the Lord to be a disciple. You have to go through, through this many classes to be a disciple. No, 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 no. The split second you get saved, you are made a disciple. So have you become a disciple of Jesus Christ? Do you really know the Lord? Have you really been saved? Have your sins been forgiven? Do you know that you know that your name is written in the Lamb's book of life? No one is a disciple of Jesus until he or she gets saved. You're birthed into the kingdom of God the moment you give your heart to Christ. When we read the book of Acts, we see that they were constantly sharing their faith and leading people to Christ so that those people would become disciples. We read about Philip in Acts chapter 8, verse 12. But when they believed Philip preaching the good news, the gospel about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women. They believed and they were being baptized. They believed and they were being baptized. This is why we don't baptize babies at Bellevue Baptist Church. There's no baby baptized in the New Testament. That is not, with all due respect, a biblical practice. You don't baptize babies. You baptize born-again, regenerated, Holy Spirit-filled people. You baptize the people who have been saved to show that they are saved. You put a wedding ring on somebody that just said, their vows to their spouse. I believe that's the moment they get married and you put the wedding ring on as a symbol to show that you belong to that person. You get baptized, it's like putting on a wedding ring. After you get saved is when you get baptized. The Bible says in Acts chapter 14, verses 20 and 21, but when the, while the disciples stood around him, he got up, he entered the city, that's Paul, he had been stoned, I believe to death. I believe God raised him from the dead and they prayed over him. The next day he went away with Barnabas to Derbe and after they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples. What does that mean? They had led a lot of people to faith in Jesus Christ. They returned to Lystra and to Iconium and to Antioch. The disciples preached the gospel and people got saved and they were made disciples. So the first aspect of disciple making is to make a disciple to win them to faith in Jesus Christ and it never gets old. A group of us went out this past Friday night on Beale Street. We prayed with people. We shared the gospel. At least one person was saved. At least one person became a disciple. They repented and believed in Jesus. That's what God wants us to do. You don't have to go to Beale Street, by the way. Whatever street you're on, there are lost people. If it bothers you that I go to Beale Street, the Lord told me to. You can talk to him about it. I believe that's where Jesus would go. Romans 15, Paul says, 
Verses 18 and following, for I will not presume to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me, resulting in the obedience of the Gentiles by word and deed, in the power of signs and wonders, that is, miracles, in the power of the Spirit, so that from Jerusalem all around, as far as Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. What's he saying there? I'm making disciples. I'm leading people to faith in Christ. You say, Brother Steve, that's the Apostle Paul. I understand, but he's telling us what we ought to do as well. Every one of you ought to be sharing your testimony during the week. Every one of you ought to be sharing with uh, people. When we were on Beale Street the other night, there were, I guess, about a dozen young men over there. And I went up to them, saluted them. Here, you say, how do you lead in? I say, I'm a Baptist preacher. We're down here praying for people. How are you all doing? I mean, let's just go ahead and just lay it out. How are you doing? And we're down here praying for people. Any way we can pray for you? They say, he's about to get married. I said, oh, man, that's awesome. And so we all on Beale Street all laid hands on him and prayed for him. Am I trying to brag? No, I'm just trying to say, but I shared the gospel with them. I shared my testimony with them, shared with them how God pulled me out of all that stuff. Pulled me out of the miry clay, set my feet on a rock, put a new song in my heart. How many of you know what I'm talking about? He, he pulled you out. He put you on a rock. He put himself in you. He changed your life. Man, you can't not talk about that. That's all, that's all you want to talk about is what Jesus did for you. You've got to make disciples. You've got to start talking about what the Lord's done for you. Now, if you say, I don't know that the Lord has done anything for me, then, hey, at the end of this service or even before, hey, don't wait. If you want to come on and get saved while I'm preaching, that'll be the best interruption I could have. Just come on up. Brother Steve, I want to get saved. Okay, somebody grab this guy. Somebody grab this lady and take them over. Let's get them saved real quick. You give your heart to Christ. You become a disciple. The first thing is this, make a disciple. And then after that, you mature disciples. This is where I really want to spend a little time. Teaching them to observe, Jesus said, all that I commanded you. This is where I missed out as a seven-year-old boy. No one taught me. So I lived in disobedience for 11 years. I'm not blaming anybody in particular. I'm not blaming my home church. But I'm telling you, if somebody had been willing to mentor me, if somebody had been willing to pour into my life, I would have let them. I was hungry, but I ate in the wrong pastures. The whole concept of maturing is similar to a child growing up. We wouldn't even think of having a baby and then just putting that child in a bed and say, hey, your mom and I are tired. You know, she's been having you for nine months and uh, we're going to go to Florida. <laughs> Hope you're okay. And yet we do that with new believers in Christ all the time. Oh, you got saved. You got baptized. Wonderful. And it is wonderful. But then we don't tell them and help them. We don't tell them how to grow. We don't help them to grow. We don't teach them how to read the Bible. You know what? Kids require a lot of attention. We just had grandbabies this week. They require a lot. Donna, would you like to give a testimony <laughs> about this? And they're wonderful. They're wonderful. But they don't rear themselves. They don't raise themselves. you got to pour into children, don't you? Isn't that right? Don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. Listen to this about Jesus. When they had performed, Mary and, and Joseph, when they had performed everything according to the law, they got him circumcised, the Lord. They returned to Galilee, Jesus' little child there, their own city of Nazareth, and the child, Jesus, continued to grow and become strong. Even Jesus had to grow 
physically increasing in wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. There's another verse that says in, in verse 52, it says, he increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. Luke 2, 52, Jesus increased. He grew as a believer. He was growing physically, spiritually, emotionally, all these ways, and his parents were discipling him. And just as someone needs to grow and mature physically, Christian disciples need to grow and mature spiritually. We put newborn babies in the bed and go to Florida all the time. We put them in there wet. We baptize them. But then we say, okay, Here's the Bible, have at it. How many of you taught your kids how to drive? Anybody out there? And, and, and you can say, yes, I did that, yes, I did that. <laughs> Man, that's not easy. You take your life in your own hands. When you're out with a, you know, I see people, they're, they're always teaching people how to drive on our parking lots out here, Amen. I mean, you just see them, they just, because they know that there's a, a better chance of them not getting killed out in our parking lots because we've got so much room to make mistakes. Well, you teach children to do a lot of things. You teach them how to walk, and everybody's excited. You teach them how to talk, how to eat, and they just get it. You know, when they're starting to eat, they just poke, your, they poke all that stuff all over their face. You just, ah, ha, ha, and finally, they hit their mouth, and you're all excited. Well, that's about how messy it is when you're trying to teach a new Christian to really grow. They mess up. They do sinful things. And you say, why'd you do that? And then you start thinking about, I did the same thing. But you have, you're there, and when they start to really get it, it's like when your kids, when your children really get it when it comes to Jesus. I mean, they're not just going to church because mom and dad told them to go. They're going because they want to go. They're going because they love Jesus and they really want to grow. Now we're talking. Just because somebody, just like somebody needs to grow physically, you and I need to grow spiritually. Paul said, in 1 Corinthians 14, 20, brethren, don't be children in your thinking. There are adults that are childlike in their thinking. They get their little feelings hurt all the time. And they constantly have to be propped up and stoked up and patted on the back. And if you don't treat them just exactly right, they cry and they manipulate and they act mad and they like a bunch of little kids. Don't act like you don't know what I'm talking about. Some of y'all are married to them. Amen. <laughs> Don't be children in your thinking, yet in evil be infants, but in your thinking be mature. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13, he gave some as apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastors and teachers. What? For the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we have all attained to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, that's the goal, to the measure of the stature which belongs to the fullness of Jesus Christ. Peter said the same thing in 2 Peter 3.18. This is one of my favorite verses on maturing. Let's all read it together. This is good. Read it with me now. But grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. And all God's people said, Amen. grow in grace. Grow in Christ-likeness. Grow in maturity. There's always another level up in Jesus. You will never, ever become totally Christ-like. There's always room to grow. There's always room. I told you I was going to be calm and quiet. There's always room to advance in the Christian life. Always. Because we are sinful. We are flawed and He is perfect, and so we're always looking to Him, trying to be like Him. Yes, we make progress, but it, we won't be totally like Him in this process of sanctification until we see Him and we experience full glorification in heaven. We will be like Him as He is we're going to be. We're becoming like Him, but we're going to be like Him when we see Him. And basically, this is why I'm preaching this whole series. 
There are these disciplines that you have to get involved in if you're going to mature. You just have to. You say, well, I don't like that. Well, you know what? If you want to lose weight, you've got to get some discipline. You've got to exercise, and you've got to eat correctly. It's not, you know, you say, no, I'd, I'd rather buy one of those wrap things, you know. <laughs> wrap that around me, and I'd rather do that. Well, you just see how that wrapping goes, because once you unwrap it, whatever was there when you wrapped it is still going to be in there, all right? <laughs> I'm sorry. But uh, I'd better do us all a favor and keep it wrapped, all right? <laughs> so, uh, okay, okay. Well, I better get back on the sermon quick, okay? <laughs> you got to be disciplined. You got to do, do some things differently if you want different results. You can't keep doing what you've been doing and get any kind of different results. You can't do it. So I've been talking about what? Bible intake. Man, you need the Word of God. First and foremost, you need to be reading this. You need to be memorizing this. You need to be meditating on this. You need to be praying the Word of God, living the Word of God. The devil will beat you up if you don't live in the Word of God. This is what matters right here. This is truth. And then you pray. You pray until you, you, you get down on your knees, your face, whatever, and don't you get up until you got what you went down for. Amen? I mean, you pour your heart out to God. You learn to worship. You learn to witness. You enjoy fellowship with other believers. You quit being a loner. Well, I'm just a loner. No, you're not. If you're a Christian, you're connected to the body of Christ. And you need to do what you're supposed to do to connect with other people proactively seeking other Christians out because iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. You need to be around other Christians. And you quit saying you're a loner. Cut that out. That's a a cop out. That's an excuse. That's sin is what it is. It's sin. Who do you think you are? You get a buy because you're a loner? You're not a loner. God made you to connect with other people. You've got some things you could help somebody else out with if you'd quit being so selfish and so wrapped up in yourself. Get involved in other people's lives. Warfare, connecting, sharing Jesus, making disciples, worshiping. In the days to come, I'll talk about family, managing time, managing money, Love like it matters. Give like it matters. Give thanks like it matters, rather. You have to keep engaging. It's every day, every day. When I played football, every day we tackled, we blocked, we ran the ball, we did the fundamentals. There's just some things in the Christian life you never get you never get tired of. You never have to. You get you don't get to quit doing. You don't get to quit praying. You don't get to quit reading your Bible, and and you don't quit get to quit sharing the gospel and fellowshipping and connecting and worshiping. You just don't. That's what you do every day, every day until you see Jesus. That's what you do. Why? Because those disciplines, those disciplines are what make you grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Same thing about marriage. Every day you pray with your spouse. You compliment your spouse. You work with your spouse. You care for your spouse. It never gets old. You keep on being loyal and faithful to your spouse. Why? Because you're married. You're one with one another. And when you're in love with Jesus Christ, you minister to Him the same way. You talk to Him. You talk about Him. You read His Word. He talks to you. The Spirit of God is filling you. And you're in love with Jesus. You've got a relationship going on. And when you have a relationship, you have to put something in it to get something out of it. And some of you are not putting anything into it. And that's why you're not getting anything out. You're writing blank checks because you haven't made any deposits. You got nothing in your spiritual bank. You don't read the Bible. You don't pray. You come to church once a week. And I thank God that you do. But I'm telling you, it's more than that. It's more than that. Are you really a disciple that's growing in Jesus Christ? If you're not, I'll tell you who to blame. Go look in the mirror. Just go look in the mirror. You get hungry enough, you'll find the bread of life. And then finally, make disciples, mature disciples, multiply disciples. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. 
And lo or behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. How do you make disciples? What's the process? 2 Timothy 2.2. The things Paul says to his favorite disciple, Timothy, the things which you have heard from me, Timothy, in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. There are four levels here. Level number one, Paul himself. Paul got saved. A guy named Ananias went to Damascus, led him to Christ, and Paul got saved. And then Paul found this young man who was already saved, but he, Paul started pouring into his life, Timothy and many witnesses. In that verse, he said, the things you heard me teach to you in the midst of many witnesses. So Paul got poured into by Ananias. We don't see Ananias in the text, so Paul, we'll just let Paul be level one. Level two is Timothy and the other witnesses that heard what Paul said when he was talking to Timothy. And then a level three. Paul says, the things that you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust these to faithful men. Faithful men. But that's not enough, Timothy. There's got to be another level. Level four. Entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. In one breath, in one breath, Paul talked about four levels of Christianity. Paul, Timothy and many witnesses, others, and faithful men. Paul, Timothy and many witnesses, others, faithful men. Dad, child, grandchild, great-grandchild. Who are your spiritual children? Who have you led to Christ? Who are your spiritual grandchildren? Who have you made into a disciple by winning them to Christ and mentoring them? Who have they led to disciples? Who are your spiritual grandchildren? grandchildren? And do you have great-grandchildren spiritually? Now do you understand what Jesus is saying when he says make disciples? It's make disciples, mature disciples, but then multiply disciples. I want to show you what multiplication does. Look at this graph on the screen. Let's say in one year Let's say I go plant a church somewhere. and Okay, every year we're going to add one person a day to the church. How many of you would say that is an awesome church? Anybody out there? A person a day. 365 people a year get saved, come into the church. I mean, they really get turned on the Lord. And then there's another dude over here. He said, you know what? I'm all about addition, but I'm going to really practice multiplication. I'm going to win two people to the Lord. And I am going to mentor them for a year. Okay, great. Go to second year. <clears throat> ah, got eight, eight, thirty, seven, seven hundred and thirty people now, man. We're up. Look at them. They're at four. Bless their hearts. Okay, third year. Thousand ninety-five, man. We get to go to the Mega Metro conference now, baby. Because we reach four digits. All right. And they just got eight. Bless their hearts. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Uh oh. Keep going. Whoa. 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 Hit. Keep going. Whoa. Wait a minute. Oh my. What happened? About year 12, the multipliers blow right past all the addition people. How can we reach a million people in Memphis by making disciples? Some of you are like me, like I was. 
never memorized the scripture, never read the Bible, don't pray. You got saved, you got baptized. You go to church, you're not a bad person. But you've got things in your life that you know don't need to be there. You're not walking in victory, you know it. Your life's not where it needs to be. Your marriage is not what it needs to be. You're not passing your faith on to anybody. You're just kind of stuck. You're not growing. Some of you know that the Holy Ghost is talking to you right now. I've been there. I know how frustrating that is. But I'm telling you, the only reason you're going to stay there is because you choose to. There is a way out. You, can, you, are, a, you are a disciple, okay? But you can start making disciples. And you can start maturing disciples and you can start multiplying disciples and then you're going to find out what the Christian life is really all about. Immediately after this is over with, right outside these doors, we're going to have people out there, Bill Street and others, we offer discipleship groups be three, four, five men, three, four, five women. They read the Bible. They discuss. They encourage one another. They meet once a week for about a year. And they hold each other accountable on Bible reading and all those things. And they encourage and they pray and they share life. And all of a sudden they start to realize this is not rocket science. I can do this. We've got people that haven't even finished high school that have gone through this course. You don't have to be a scholar to love Jesus. We've got people that have, done, that have PhDs that have gone through this too. You don't have to check your brain at the door to follow Jesus. And some of you desperately need this. So when we're through, just go right out here. I hope they're swamped. But stay there until you get some help, until you get signed up. They'll send you some materials, tell you how the process works. But I just want to encourage you. If you don't know the Lord, become a disciple today. Be saved today. But if you're just, you say, I've been there, done that, I've been baptized, but I'm not growing. Man, give it the program. I don't know what to do. Yes, you do. I just told you what to do. You can't leave here today and say, I don't know what to do. Yes, you do. You do know what to do. You you are not too old, you are not too young, you are not too busy to start growing as a Christian. Go out there and get some help. You can go to church all you want to. That's great, but it's not enough. You got to really start putting something into this disciple thing and make disciples. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen? Make disciples like it matters. Father, help us. Help us to be not only disciples, but disciple makers. I pray it in Jesus' name. And if that's your prayer, say amen.